Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel Podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's in structural engineering from UC San Diego. And I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas, received my bachelor's in civil engineering from UT Austin, and I'm currently an MBA candidate at Auburn. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Badri Hirier, Vice President and Director of Artificial Intelligence at Thornton Tomasetti, about the applications of AI and machine learning in the AEC industry. In his current position, Dr. Hirier leads to the Core.AI Research and Development Group focused on developing applications that leverage machine learning and AI to transform various workflows and processes within the AEC sector. He is also the founder and CEO of T2D2.ai, a technology startup providing cloud-based asset management that uses computer vision to detect and map deterioration and damage in structures using drone or mobile camera feeds. Prior to establishing Core.ai at Thorn Tomasetti, Dr. Hirier spent several years as a computational scientist in the company's applied sciences practice, where he developed high-performance computing software used by the Navy for computational fluid dynamic simulations. Dr. Hirier has a master's degree from John Hopkins University and a PhD from Columbia University. Now let's jump into our conversation with Bobby. Badri, welcome to the Structural Engineering Channel podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Could you tell our listeners, you know, just a little bit about your career journey, how you got to where you're at, and ultimately what you do at Thornton Tomasetti? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so, yes, yeah, so right now I'm a VP and Director of AI at Thornton Tomasetti. So I've been in this position for about eight years now. Uh, but Going back to the beginning, I moved to this country back in 2001. I came here as a fresh graduate student at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I got my undergrad degree in civil engineering. Uh, and then uh, I, was, I got my master's in 2003 and then worked for a couple of years, uh, a few years in Chicago, uh, the Midwest area, and then moved to the Bay Area. I was working in industry product uh, development, research, and testing positions. Uh, one was Clark Dietrich, which is a metal framing company, and then Simpson Strong Tie, which many of your listeners might be familiar with. Uh, they're a big manufacturer of structural connectors and so on. So back in 2008, I decided to actually go back to grad school to pursue my PhD in uh, uh, computational mechanics, because that was, a, that was a strong interest of mine. I wanted to get back more deep into that subject. So I went to Columbia University. I you know, spent about three and a half years there, and I graduated in 2012. I worked with Sandia Labs during that time, uh, you know, working on high performance computing software for tractor mechanics. Um, and, and then after my graduation, I joined this company called Widelinger Associates. Widelinger merged with Thornton Thomas Study in 2015. So I've been with this combined firm for about eight years now. Uh, so I was, I was an applied scientist or a computational scientist, you know, developing software for the U.S. Navy on computational fluid dynamics and, and high performance computing and so on. But over the past three to four years, I've been working on machine learning and artificial intelligence applications. And so that uh, led me to my current role as the director of AI. And some of the projects that I have led have turned into uh, and uh, into separate products and then uh, you know, so in my current role, I work on leading R&D efforts, especially in the AI and ML area and bringing about these uh, new technologies to, into applications in the AEC industry. So that is my full-time job. My second full-time job is actually as the founder and CEO of uh, T2D2, which I will uh, get to hopefully uh, later during the show. I want to, yeah. of course, mention my third full-time job as the father of two uh, sweet little kids. But <laughs> that's <laughs> Exactly. Very impressive. I know that's, that's another full-time job, like you were saying. Um, <laughs> that's really interesting. And, and what's really fascinating to me, you know, just to get into the bulk of this is, you know, a lot of people, you know, the industry is always asking, 
hey, how do we, what's the future going to look like with AI and stuff? It's, it's kind of cool that, you know, you're affect, you're directly affect, like shaping it. So that's, what's really cool. And that's how we, we found you, you know, we found this article in AISC magazine and a really interesting uh, article. Uh, I think what impressed me was you, so let me just read this correctly. So Thornton Tomasetti's core studio developed an application called Asterix, uh, which is basically a web-based software package that allows you to do uh, concept level, schematic design level designs on building structures. Like, so you're using like uh, data analytics rather than engineering analysis. So it's basically AI, correct me if I'm wrong, but could you tell us something a little more about that? Cause that just seems really interesting. and. I know the industry is really uh, interested in, in things like that too. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there are definitely a lot of applications for AI and I'll get to that. And I'll, we can probably also talk about the definition of AI and, and uh, the distinction between narrow AI and general AI. But coming back to your question about asterisk, yes, it's a great tool. So, uh, you know, just imagine that, you know, you're a young engineer and you're designing a building and, uh, you come up with some uh, member sizes and you go to this very senior engineer and you ask her, okay, you know, based on your experience, you think this member size seems appropriate and she'll probably tell you that, okay, you know, she's worked on the, you know, engineering tall buildings for decades, maybe 20, 30 years. And she can say, oh, based on my experience, I think that member size looks good. Okay. For that particular profile, but maybe over here, you know, this member size looks, looks, looks too light. Maybe you should, go back and recheck your calculations and so on. So how is she able to do that? You know, just based on years of experience, it's because she's seen so many buildings, she's designed so many beams and columns and base. She knows this from experience. Now, the idea behind asterisk is that we wanted to encapsulate that same experiential knowledge in a software program. Uh, and so we wanted to train a system that has seen thousands of designs and has captured, okay, what are the features, what are the parameters that lead to certain design decisions and so on. With asterisk, you can take a, a you can, what, what you would input is basically like a very simple geometry, a massing, uh, you know, height profile and so on. Just with that input, uh, it first goes through a geometry service, which breaks it down into, you know, different base and uh, columns and, and so on. And that, goes to the core learn piece, which is the central brain behind uh, designing these structures. I mean, you know, when I say brain, it's actually just what, what it has seen before. It's just a supervised learning uh, system that has seen lots of different designs before. Uh, so you have a, you know, a beam designer, a column designer, a bay, bay designer, and so on. So these are the various components within it. And just based on the parameters that are input, it is going to give out, okay, these are most likely the members for, for these profiles. So because this is an inference service, it happens very quickly. So that means that, you know, you can quickly come up with like a first order design. You know, it's not, not something that has gone through a you know, stability check or a strength check or a serviceability check, but you know, it's a first order design. You know, it's most likely uh, these member sizes are appropriate for this particular design that can also lead to computations of, okay, this is the total amount of tonnage for this building. This is the amount of embodied uh, carbon, because that's also an important consideration these days with you know, carbon neutrality um, being a strong focus in the coming few, you know, coming decades. So you know, these are questions that you can answer at you know, the snap of a finger instead of having, through, having to go through like a very detailed uh, design that might take you know, hours or, or, or weeks. Uh, so it's a great tool for early stage optioneering as, as we call it. You want to evaluate maybe three or four different designs. You can quickly come up with a massing and a design and you can say, okay, this one, the tonnage is, is so much. This is the concrete tonnage. This is the embodied uh, carbon involved. You change the parameters, you change the design and you quickly come up with a new estimate. And so you can quickly evaluate a bunch of different uh, you know, designs and compare them across different parameters of interest. So I think it's a great tool, a machine learning uh, engine that is running the design service. Yeah, so important too. And, you know, especially during the early phases where the clients are always, can we do this? Can we do this? Or what if we do this? How do we optimize this? And you exactly. don't always have to keep going back and rerunning, uh, I don't know, like an ETABS model or, or whatever. Um, 
I just wanted to ask too, because I think you, you made a good point. Can you just do like a quick rundown of the differences between, you know, AI and machine learning? I get confused between that too. Like, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Can you just do a quick definition of that? Uh, sure, certainly. So, I mean, in, just in terms of, uh, you know, AI in general, so uh, how do you differentiate between AI and, uh, and automation? In many cases, you know, you, you you can automate a lot of things using computer programming. You know, what is, how is AI different if you're automating something? Uh, the only difference is that, let's say, for example, you want to go from A to E. And if you write down the rules, you go from A to B. If B, then go to C. If not, go to D, and then go to E. So that is a procedural rule that you write down. And if you write it down uh, procedurally, then that's just, you know, um, normal automation. But if you just show a bunch of examples uh, to a program uh, that show the program how to go, f uh, that, you know, these are the cases where you go from A to E, and the program learns all the rules, all the internal rules by itself, that I would say is artificial intelligence. Um, and if, you know, machine learning, I think, can be used uh, uh, interchangeably with artificial intelligence in this context. If you have a machine that is learning all of the rules, uh, all of the internal rules, uh, uh, you know, to achieve a certain objective, then it's artificial intelligence. But I would also like to make the distinction between artificial general intelligence and artificial narrow intelligence, or narrow AI and general AI. Because a lot of times, I think these days, especially with all this buzz, buzz about AI, people tend to conflate AI with you know general artificial intelligence about robots having some sort of consciousness and uh, you know ha having their own agenda and so on. But that's very different from narrow AI. I mean, the uh, the actual technological advances that we've seen today and the various applications that we see in AI is, is all uh, right now at least uh, in, in narrow AI. So if you take the narrow functions of let's say visual recognition or audio recognition, natural language understanding, uh, data analytics. So these are narrow functions which can be uh, you know, certainly optimized or automated through AI. And, and this is where I think we see a lot of uh, applications. So general AI is probably a you know, few years or maybe even a few decades away, uh, but you know, I, we already see a lot of potential for narrow AI in various applications. I love it. I think you gave us such a great definition. So thank yeah. you for breaking that down, Matt. Great question. Cause I was like, man, you know, I know I learned about this a little bit but it's always good to have a refresher. Um, I, <laughs> wait, as soon as you said general AI and narrow AI, um, I understand what you're speaking about. If any of our audience has ever watched the, the TV show Person of Interest, that is general AI. That is, that is an all-knowing machine being of sorts, right? Is that kind of the, what we would define general AI as, Baudry? Yes, certainly. You see, I mean, I think most of the uh, instances that you see in popular media and in various movies and, and shows, uh, you know, you see basically a general AI that you know, that, that does a lot of different functions that can do natural language understanding, visual mm -hmm. recognition, and that can take decisions and so on that, you know. So I, that's still a few years away, although a lot of companies, <laughs> I believe, um, you know, many big tech companies are, are working towards that goal. But absolutely. Yeah. What we are dealing with is narrow AI. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. We're not, we're not dealing with Watson here. We're working with something very focused and with a, with a specific need, um, which Correct. brings me to my next question, which you, you set me up for so nicely, which is what are some of those most important applications of AI in structural engineering? Yes, certainly. Uh, so I mentioned to you already, like, you know, within narrow AI, there are, uh, you know, these various uh, functions. So one is visual recognition. There is uh, natural language understanding. There is audio recognition, data analytics, and so on. Within structural engineering, I think you know if you take each of those applications, there are various, uh, you know, there, there are various, uh, you know, potential applications in the structural engineering world. And in general, in the engineering and construction world, there are applications on the construction site, and there are applications on the engineer's desk. Um, you know, on the engineer's desk, you can you can imagine for visual recognition, there are applications like you know being able to uh, you know analyze uh, construction drawings. Uh, various shop drawings, identifying various uh, features within those. Are there any anomalies? Being able to quickly identify those anomalies, or you know, being able to uh, uh, you know quantify trends across different uh, you know ac ac across different quantities of interest, and so on. So, 
just that's you know that's just uh, from a drawing perspective and then from a natural language understanding perspective i think you can have you can imagine various systems that can uh, help make the engineer's job a lot easier you should be you know just imagine a a chat bot that you can um, that you can query you can ask a lot of these questions instead of having to uh, go to a reference you know you can have a system that can understand the query and uh, go to the specific uh, database and find the answer and come back to you so a lot of these everyday uh, applications you know that has more than just you know uh, consumer applications that has you know, that could, that could be specifically trained to to serve an engineer's needs uh, on the construction side you have of course various applications you know you have applications for robotics uh, you have applications for uh, visual understanding that can identify okay is the job uh, you know on track what what is the current status it can automatically recognize if you know if there's a truck that came in that contained uh, uh you know the the, the steel the steel members that were going to be used what is the level of progress of construction uh if there are maybe safety conditions that are being uh, violated and so on so there's just tons of applications on the construction side there are applications on on the engineer engineering that side and then beyond just engineering and construction if you think about uh the maintenance and the lifetime of the building you you know you have tons of applications over there as well uh, for example t2d2 one of you know the, the the tool that i mentioned before uh so that involves uh, visual recognition of uh, facade damage for example so over the lifetime of a building you want to identify the deterioration or damage conditions on a facade on a roof or a structural member you can do that visual recognition using a tool like t2d2 um uh, so you know just over the lifetime of a building uh for, right from inception all the way to uh you know to the end of life of building i think there are just tons of applications for ai and i didn't even mention data analytics which has you know applications across all of the uh, the whole spectrum of engineering Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've, you've really given me a lot to think about here and you did such a great job of breaking down all of these different facets that can affect not only, you know, conceptual design from actually, you know, um, cranking out calculations for beam sizing and, and all of these different small executions that we already do, as well as the impact on construction in the long run. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions here. So you used this term earlier called optioneering, which I'm a huge fan of. I love that. Um, and we, we kind of get this buzz in the engineering, structural engineering industry right now about how do we put power back in the SE's hands? How do we differentiate ourselves? How do we increase scope? How do we demand higher fees? And how do we become the prime on the, on the, on the project? And this seems like such a great opportunity for us to be able to, to take power back and to demonstrate our engineering expertise using this tool to, to, to show ourselves as a greater partner in conceptual phase to the client, to the eventual owner. Um, do you agree with that? yeah i certainly agree with that i think you know that this can be a, so i you know if if we think about ai as um you know as just transforming a certain section of of the current process uh, that that's probably a very limited view i think uh, the use of tools like this the use of technology can actually transform the entire process uh, um you know you know instead of an engineer being uh, involved only after the you know the the whole uh, you know architecture and the design has been um you know has has been has been um finalized you can have the engineer come in at a much earlier stage and be involved in the uh, optioneering or the you know the conceptual design stage as well, as well so i think yes there are definitely you know various applications of ai that can transform the entire process Perfect. Perfect. And, and the flip side of that coin is instead of this, you know, big industry topic right now, I want to focus, I'm going to shift really quickly to a focus of um, something that impacts all of us, regardless of really what industry we're in, which is um, spent, you know, being as effective as we can, as productive as we can in the office, and then getting to spend the rest of our, of our weekdays spending time on things that we'd like to do, which is being at home with our families or spending hobbies or, or you know, act, being active. Um, and that is, you keep mentioning how so many of these processes um, outside of the conceptual phase, when we're actually executing um, different calculations and, and, and design iterations, can make us much more efficient and much more effective in our work. So I'm also saying that there's an opportunity to use these kind of tools to de derive greater profit for the, the actual engineering firm by being able to demand the same amount of scope to do the same amount of work, 
but be able to get off maybe a couple of hours early, get seven hours of work done in, in five hours and then get home and, and do whatever you need to get done. Yeah, absolutely. So actually on that uh, topic, you know, you might, uh, there's actually, there's a McKinsey study from maybe about five years ago. I see that in a lot of conferences and I'm sure you've seen that graphic too, that compares the uh, level of productivity change across many industries over the past few years and decades. And there are lots of industries where they've seen like tremendous gains in productivity over the past few years, uh, but construction was actually down at the very, uh, in low end, uh, the, you know, the productivity was was not not very good uh, over the past maybe what 50 years that it that the chart showed. I think you know with the new technologies that are uh, coming into the picture now, I think that is going to change. I think you can have uh, a significant productivity increase. You know these tools are, are you know can help take away those hours uh, you know doing mundane tasks. There are lots of repetitive tasks that. Uh, that can be automated and that can, you know, you can enhance the, uh, you know, the, the, the processes and give back some time to the engineers with the productivity gains. Uh, Badri, uh, thanks for explaining that. I, I did want to get into, I know you mentioned this before, it's, it's the T2D2, that's the Thornton Tomasetti damage detector. That seemed really interesting just from the brief time that you mentioned it. Could you go more into that? That's, that's something that, um, you know, I haven't heard of before, so it'd be really yeah, good to absolutely. get I'd into love that. To go. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to get into that because I'm, as I mentioned, I all, I'm also the uh, founder uh, and CEO of T2D2, which, is, uh, which started off as like innovation project within Taunton Tomasetti, uh, but, but quickly because of the great potential, because of the great performance, turned into a product that could be spun off uh, with, uh, as, as its own startup. So now it's a startup that is you know, part of uh, the twin accelerator. So there's an internal TT accelerator that, um, you know, that, that spun it off. And, and right now it's a, it's a separate company. And just this morning, we had some great news because the DOB, the New York City Department of Buildings, had an innovation contest for uh, called the hack the code building hack the building code innovation contest so they were soliciting various new ideas to uh, to transform uh, you know how you know how, how transform the building codes the way with the various prescriptive regulations that are in the building codes how do we modernize the building codes to use the new, newest and you know the latest and greatest technology so T2D2 was one of the entries. It was among the finalists, and then it was uh, one of the winners. So we are very happy to announce that we we're one of the winners of this inaugural contest. Uh, what T2D2 is, is, as the name mentions, apart from an obvious nod to George Lucas and uh, and Star Wars, uh, T2D2 <laughs> stands for Taunton Tomasetti Damage Detector. Uh, so it uses computer vision uh, to automatically detect deterioration and damage conditions in facade. Uh, um, building and building envelopes, facades, structures, and, and so on. And how do we do that? So because TT has been involved in uh, renewal and forensics practices for many years, for decades actually. So we've been inspecting various buildings, bridges, tunnels, and all of these structures. And we have a large database of images that we've collected of various types of deterioration. We've used this vast data set, we've annotated them, and we've trained uh, advanced deep learning models and these are the same models that are used in you know, image recognition, you know, that could be for facial recognition, that could be for uh, medical diagnosis. You, you see various applications of image recognition, object detection, and uh, computer vision these days. So we use some of the same uh, advanced state-of-the-art computer vision models. We've trained it on our uh, large data sets that have been annotated specifically for this purpose. And we have a series of modules uh, that, that does you know, that task of identifying damage uh, in structures uh, using these models. And we've built a portal where you can actually visualize those results and we present sort of a digital twin to the client, to the end client that shows their asset and how, you know, where all the conditions uh, have been found and, uh, you know, how, how they map to that structure. Especially with the use of drones, this can be like a really, um, you know, great technology. You can have a drone fly around a structure in a matter of a few hours instead of having to scaffold it the building and or have uh, you know gondolas that are dropping down uh, that would you know it's a lot of expense it's a lot of time and a lot of effort if you have a drone that captures all of the images then we can quickly process them identify all of the detections have an engineer review those detections and present to the client like an overview of the 
you know, state of their facade in a matter of a uh, few hours. So that's, that's, I think, a revolutionary technology. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great use of computer vision in our industry to, you know, to manage the process of facade inspection. And that's not just for buildings, that has applications in, you know, bridges, tunnels, nuclear reactors, and, you know, there's just, just endless opportunities there. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, definitely something of the future where you have a drone or kind of like those video games where it has like those, you know, you're flying across and then it'll detect like damage here, or damage there. So that's pretty much what it's doing, right? You take a, yes. uh, take a picture and it'll show, it'll at least tell you based on all the data from all the, the subsets that you've given it before. It's like, oh, I've seen this type of damage before. This looks like it's corroding. And that's what the T2D2 will tell you. It'll basically tell you uh, an analysis of what damage that it sees or, or doesn't see. So yes, instead exactly. of, yeah, instead of an engineer going through each and every picture, it'll already exactly. tell you once you take it. Yeah, right. it's crazy. That's correct. So it actually, so there are serious modules, like I said. So first it'll identify, okay, I'm looking at a brick masonry building. No, I'm looking at a stucco, I'm looking at concrete. And then depending on what material substrate it is, it's going to identify if it's a concrete building, it's, you know, you're seeing exposed rebar and corrosion, you're exposed, you're seeing spalling and so on. For a brick masonry building, it's going to identify these are the types of damage, open uh, mortar joints and cracked mortar joints and so on. So yeah, we, you know, we have built like a sophisticated pipeline that can identify damage conditions for different types of materials. This could be really useful. We, we had a conversation, geez, a, a few episodes back at this point um, about, actually it was our uh, still bridge episode. That's who, what it was. We were talking about bridge inspection specifically um, and, and that you know there is actually a, a huge talent uh, drought right now in the inspection community because we have a large portion of our, of our existing inspectors who are um, more tenured, we'll say, um, rather than, uh, than older, but uh, they've been with us for a long time and they're within retirement age. And it's expected that some figure like 25 to 33% of the inspection community will retire within the next five to 10 years, that there isn't a talent pool to, to backfill them effectively. And using this kind of intelligence and these kind of systems could, could help offset the need for a human to be there. Um, I guess I'm curious, what would the amount of capital take in order to substitute a human for a structure, for, to inspect and watch a structure um, you know, throughout its life cycle so that we can watch the damage that it may be um, going through? Uh, I think there, there are going to be tremendous cost savings, uh, you know, if you replace an automated system like T2D2 compared to like a manual uh, human-based inspection. Just in terms of the amount of time uh, involved, you could say uh, for, for uh, you know, setting up the scaffolding you know, and uh, the amount of time it would take to to just visually observe all of the conditions on a structure on a typical building, it might, might take probably two to three days. Uh, you know, if, if you're allowed to fly drones, then that can be done in a matter of uh, two hours uh, or less. And then if you had to process each of those images uh, for a human, that would take quite a bit of time. And of course, if you're just going through a bunch of images, uh, there's also a lot of room for error, but uh, our computer algorithms, our computer vision models, they never get tired and uh, they never sleep. Uh, so they can process each of these images with the same amount of uh, focus, um, uh, you know, in a matter of seconds. Uh, so in terms of efficiency, I think it's gonna be a very um, dramatic increase. Of course, um, is the performance of the model the same as a human inspector? Not yet. Uh, I think it's going to take some time. So right now we are having, uh, uh, you know, trained engineers and experts review the detections and make sure it, uh, you know, it, it, it marks the false positives and marks the, they mark the false negatives. Uh, and I think eventually the models can get um, so good that, you know, the, the amount of human oversight needed would be, uh, would be much less. And at that point, I, I think it's going to make the inspector's job quite a bit easier. Um, yeah, instead of having to drop down from a scaffold or drop down from a rope axis, have a digital uh, view of a building showing, okay, these are the areas that have potential damage. And maybe then it's, you know, I'm not saying that this will completely replace having to, you know, have a closer look and touch and feel the damage, you know, but you can 
quickly identify, okay, these are only the spots that I may need to go and take a closer look and probably feel, you know, touch the brick and see if it's, uh, if, if it's okay or if there's a piece of facade that may be, uh, that may be loose or something that's underneath that's not uh, you know visual it's not um that, that's not identifiable from the surface so you know you can quickly identify focus areas where you can um you can direct resources instead of having to you know just just uh, inspect uh, like an entire structure um so that's just a, just a very inefficient way of inspection Absolutely. And I think you, you, your description right there just so very nicely spelled out all of the different safety aspects that we haven't even talked about. We talked about productivity, we've talked about business opportunities, but from the safety aspect and keeping our, um, our inspectors or structural engineers or forensic engineers safe on the job site, I mean, the, the value is huge. Um, and I think you also made a great point that this isn't necessarily always about upfront ca capital. We have to think about the longevity of the structure, the lifetime of, you know, the amount of, of the scope of inspection or whatever, whatever that looks like. Um, so I guess my question to you is, as a structural engineer, as our, as if someone, if you could speak directly to our audience really quick and maybe help them understand how can we start to um, talk about this in our work today? How do we start to implement this in the projects that we're working on? Um, if I'm a really excited listener right now and I'm like, man, I want to get my hands on this. I've got the perfect project for this kind of technology. What's the first step? How do they get to include that in the project scope? Do they bring it to the owner? Or is there are there some benefits that they should you know be able to explain really eloquently? Give us give us a roadmap. Uh, certainly, I mean you could uh, for for T two D two. I would you know encourage any of the interested listeners to just visit our website. It's T two D two dot AI. There's a good description about our technology, about our service, and you know what are the various uh, features we have in our product uh, and of course, you know, we, we can, uh, and we, we're happy to answer any further questions, uh, if there are technical pointed questions about uh, how specifically it would apply to a certain building condition, if it's, uh, you know, we, we're certainly available to answer those questions. I would definitely encourage them to bring it up with the, with the building owner if this is a technology that I think that, that, uh, that, I, that if, if this technology would be useful for that site. And, you know, we have plenty of resources on our website and we're available to answer any questions if you know to identify uh, for any specific project condition if if it is applicable or not and Badri, i had one more question this is my last question so with you know all this technology is great right and uh it's really interesting to see but then now if you're thinking of, of it from a structural engineer or an engineer like, is this thing going to replace my job? So do you have uh, any, I guess, how do you see the future going in terms of uh, for maybe roles shifting instead of maybe engineers doing all of the repetitive tasks? Maybe their role can be more into maybe checking the results or how do you see this going in the future and in terms of uh, people that are afraid of like losing their jobs to AI in general? Yes, that's that's a great question, and uh, I, I think you you mentioned it, uh, you know, in your question itself. I think it's not mainly about losing jobs; it's it's mainly about how the jobs are going to change. Uh, so right now, if if there are engineers who are you know doing a lot of repetitive tasks uh, to to get to something that they can they can uh, they can answer quickly, I think they're going to find this to be very useful, right? So right now, the, you, know, you should think of AI as like a like a like a calculator or like a like a toolkit that's in your pocket that can help you answer a lot of questions that can help you as an engineer do your work uh, much more efficiently. And uh, I think eventually, of course, uh, uh, the the role might might shift. And it's not that with with AI, with the introduction of AI, you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, disruptive changes right away. It's going to start. Uh, happening uh, very incrementally. So, you know, if, if people are open-minded, if they're welcome uh, to accepting new technologies and new ways of, of doing their things, I think, you know, they're going to find this to be a very useful uh, uh, trend and a very useful development in the industry. And over time, of course, uh, you never know with them, you know, 20 years down the line, you, you, you can't say, you know, what's going to happen, but, or at least in the next uh, five years or the next 10 years, I think there are going to be lots of benefits to structural engineers to you know, make their jobs a lot more easier. 
Awesome. So Badri, leave us with the final note. What's happening in the future? What new projects are you working on? What's exciting that we should be aware of? Uh, sure. I, you know, I think this is a great time. I mean, we're working on some fantastic new technologies. Uh, at Core AI, at, as the director of Core AI, I mean, we're working on um, quite a few fascinating things, including natural language processing, data, data analytics, computer vision, and, and so on. Uh, you know, recently we had a, an internal hackathon. We, we have those uh, every once in a while. Uh, recently at one of the hackathons, we had uh, you know, prototyped uh, a machine learning hub or a dashboard where we can host uh, AI models that have been trained and that are production ready that can serve the entire AEC industry for various applications. And this could be like a central warehouse for, for trained and, and uh, um, you know, production ready AI machine learning models. If, you know, if there are application developers, if there are users of, of machine learning who do not know how to, uh, for example, build a model, uh, they can come to this marketplace, to this hub and, and just connect their application to the model. So this was an idea that we had internally brainstormed uh, recently at a hackathon. We, you know, we built a small prototype and we we're working towards that. So that's, a, that, that's one of the cool things that that we're working on these days, besides many applications, besides you know T two D two asterisk and the various other projects that we're uh, that we're developing at at core. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Badri. It's really interesting. That seems like a lot of projects, and like I said before, it's really cool to see that you you actually having a, a hand in you know developing the future, and you're actually making this stuff a reality. So uh, really thank you for, for sharing with us your insights and, and what you're working on. And I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners learned a lot. So thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to, you know, to talk to you. And I know that these are really exciting topics and I'm really happy to talk about these. Thank you for the opportunity. opportunity. 